morning of Wednesday the 21st of December 1910, 889 men and boys were working the shafts at Hulton Colliery, also known as Pretoria Pit. At 7.50am an explosion of methane gas occurred, followed by a much more powerful coal blast. A total of 344 men and boys lost their lives. The disaster was the third largest in British coal mining history. We're now going to take you to what was once Pretoria Pit, where those men and young boys lost their lives and tell you the story of that fatal day. Frankie Street. I went past this collar in, didn't they? Onto it. Yeah, they backed onto it, call it, but also backed onto it, railway line. Look at this little old mineral line, that's perfect. So we know where Branca Street was. The street was situated just near Checkerbent Roundabout. The houses were built by the Hulton Colliery Company for their employees. The back of the houses were blocked by the railway line that linked the colliery to the main line. This ran in a cutting almost beneath the front doors. The street was named after two Liverpool men, Richard and John Branca, who were early directors of the company. The Northern Healthcare building now stands at the start of what was Branca Street. So Branca Street would have come, they're in a row of terrace, pit cottages, all the way down past the, the collar here. This would have been Checkerman Pit. That Branca Street went a fair way down, didn't it? Yeah. That move. Yeah, I think seventy we were counted, didn't we? No, straight first and in between you've got the, the, the woods on the right where the, the like the telegraph pole is and then you've got a bit of a clearing yeah. and that's where Pretoria was so they would have heard the blast from here. I would imagine they'd have heard the blast not just from here. From there was a man walking down to the Holton Colliery when he was working and he was about five minutes away and he felt it then. Yeah, so it would have been a fair old bang. Yeah. Right, well, we'll carry on walking down to, is it Harley Colliery? There's a second colliery down here. Yeah. Near to the railway line. And we'll, uh, we'll bring them back if we find anything. Okay. There's another pit coming up, is it? Yeah. Do you think it's that clump of trees? No. It's either this, I think it's either one of these two, I think. I think it might be both of them. Because there were two shafts here. Yeah, I've got two. This is where Allerton Colliery's one and two would have been. This is, we think this is pit one. And that clump of trees, just down there, I think is pit two. There's no access to them, they're all fenced off. Shaft to Everton Colliery. The Pretoria Pit got its name because when the shafts were sunk, the British had recently captured South Africa of Pretoria during the Boer War. 10% of Pretoria's workforce was made up of boys from the age of 13 to 15 years. They worked as haulage hands, they had to gain experience before they worked down the pits. Coal mining was one of the main jobs for the men of Lancashire in 1910 and the boys would leave school at 13 years old to start their mining careers. Lines on the left. We can't get down though, it's, uh, it's flooded and I ain't got my wellies. Another day. 
The men were known for their toughness and bravery because it wasn't safe being down the mines, breathing in the gas and the coal dust. They knew that if they wanted to provide for their families, they would have to put up with the long hours and do the job. Families even travelled out of town to work in the collieries and live in one of the purpose-built miners' terrace cottages like the ones in Branca Street. The morning of December the 21st, 1910 was probably like any other December morning, cold, dark and damp. The miners would have got up, got ready for work, kissed their loved ones goodbye with a shout of see you later. Families would have been getting ready for Christmas, the little ones getting all excited hanging up their stockings. The men and boys making their way down the pits and starting work at 7am as normal. What happened next would tragically change those families' lives forever. At 7.50 a.m., a huge blast occurred in the plodder seam of the pit, wiping out half the workforce. 344 men and boys' lives tragically cut short. The explosion caused another tremor which was felt for miles, spreading fear into families everywhere. Distressed wives with their children ran to the mines and stood waiting for news on their loved ones. That's the push shaft now, which yeah. is over there. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. We thought it was, didn't we? So that's that building now that yeah, we stood at now. Yeah, it's a big thing here. Yeah. So what do you reckon these were then? Tracks? Look, there's some kind of tracks to get in. They wouldn't wipe the roof up the floor, don't they? Because they're parallel. Some kind of girder work. Mm -hmm. Looking at it, I'd say it had some kind of steel work on it. So this hasn't been put in, this is part of it. This is part of it, it's got like some kind of. Yeah. yeah. It's got a slant on it, so it would tip. This is just the girders go That's what all these bricks are not for then. No, we stood where Lampering would have been then, aren't we? I think that this is the edge of the, what would have been the lamp room. That's 
winding out. Pit four. The jewelry. Peaceful. It weren't that morning. The general manager of the cholera, Alfred Tung, led a rescue team into the pit. It was incredibly dangerous, but they had to find out what had happened to the men. The trench bone mine was searched, and the miners were only slightly affected by the fumes, but they shouted that they were okay. At the yard mine, a young lad, Joseph Stablet, was found alive. You've just come from over Next the three quarters mine, the workers in there shouted that they were also okay. The Arley mine, here many of the workers were breathing in deadly carbon monoxide fumes. These men were sent back up the shafts in groups of four or five. There were people coming from far and wide to help with the huge rescue operation. The first body to be brought up was that of 52 year old Richard Clayton. Most of the bodies that were found by the rescue team had no visible signs of injury as they had been overcome by fumes. So we were actually stood on top of pit shaft 4 now. So this would have been a big marshalling yard. When our wagons came and got filled with coal, taking them away. Research shows that out of 344 victims, 9% died from the blast and the rest from carbon monoxide poisoning. There's the spoil heaps. It puts three and four according to the map. That's looking down towards pit four from what would have been spoil heaps. You can't believe what was here before, can you? And all these trees. Well, I can't hear any birds proper. Not on this side, compared to the other side. No. Many families lost several loved ones, but it was a lady called Miriam Tilsley from Wingate who suffered the greatest devastation. She lost her husband, four sons and two brothers in the blast. 24 unidentified bodies are buried in a vault in West Horton Cemetery. Eight were later identified from clothing and property found and the remaining are registered as unknown males. There's bits of walls everywhere, isn't there? Christmas in West Orton would never be the same again. Almost every house had its curtains drawn as a sign of respect. The community were mourning together. Most of the families had given up hope of seeing their loved ones alive again. The rescuers were working day and night trying to get to the bodies. As the bodies were brought to the surface one by one, the families had the awful task of identifying their loved ones. 
that's that's pit shaft three then. So if that's pit three, that over there would have been winding out, wouldn't it? Over there. So we're now stood roughly where the pit egg gear would have been on pit three. Looking back towards the winding house. Sadly, some of the bodies were so badly injured that they could not be identified. Officials were trying to identify bodies from pieces of clothing and personal items found with them. The funeral services began on Christmas Day and on Boxing Day almost a hundred workers had been buried. Still all the bodies had not been found and the recovery operation went on well into the new year. On January the 4th, 1911, a number of badly mutilated bodies were found at the bottom of the shaft. They had been propelled through the shaft by the sheer force of the blast that hit the yard mine. Work resumed at Pretoria Pit on the 11th of January 1911. More than a month before the last body was pulled from the rubble on the 14th of February 1911. The verdict at the inquest said that the explosion was probably due to a defective or overheated safety lamp. The youngest victim was just 13 and the oldest was 61. Pretoria Pit closed as a working pit in April 1934.